Well, greetings. We're now going into the second week on the concepts of disease transmission. First off, I just want to bring up one point. Some of you may have been wondering why in week one we were reading these papers about diseases going back hundreds, if not thousands of years, almost to the prehistoric time. What you really have to think about is this. A, uh, diseases have been around for a long, long time. Sometimes they pop up again. They reemerge. Sometimes they are kept down. Um, but also you have to think about it from the perspective that we would say that diseases had been caused by X and Y and Z. Okay. For example, um, the colonists and Columbus, etc., brought smallpox over. Surprise, smallpox has been around for quite some time. Plague, same thing. It's been brought in by certain um, invasions. What we're going to find as we understand the concepts of disease transmission is that there are situations where, yes, diseases die out. There's also situations where diseases are not going to be present in humans, but can be uh, present in reservoirs, such as animals, and then begin to get jumped back into human beings. So, let's get started, shall we? Now, for the modes of transmission, we have to get used to a lot of different terminologies here. Fomites are non-living objects that may harbor pathogens, and susceptible individuals can become infected by just touching contaminated objects. So this can be handrails, it can be doorknobs, it can be... Uh, push panels that you push the doors open with. And it can be some other items that you would take. Uh, cell phones, for example. I've had students that have done a microbiological assessment of a cell phone. They found out there's a lot of stuff on that. Um, we can have also drinking glasses and such like that if they have not been cleaned. Now, the mode of transmission refers to the method that a pathogen uses to get from a starting point to a destination. In other words, knowing the mode of transmission for a given disease can be useful for a number of reasons. Now, when I talk about this, I can say, well, what if it's waterborne? What if it's fecal oral? What if it's aerosolized by a sneeze or a cough? The mode defines certain characteristics of the pathogen and the resulting disease. It allows us to target our response and interventions to predict and prevent a particular disease or other pathogens transmitted through the similar routes. Uh, if you think about COVID, where everybody went bananas over COVID and, and wanting to wear a mask or not wear a mask and all this other stuff, but the purpose of the mask was to block the inhalation of the virus if it was aerosolized. The same thing can happen with a variety of other diseases that can be aerosolized by a cough and a sneeze, etc. But what if it's not by that method? What if it's by personal hand-to-hand -hand con uh, contact, shaking hand, etc.? Okay, now, knowing the mode of transmission allows us to conceptualize how a given disease may be at the interface of the epidemiological triangle and the relationships between the host, the pathogen, and the environment. If you forget the, uh, basically, the epidemiological triangle, go back to week one's lecture. Also, it can help us uh, project and visualize the trajectory of the disease 
and its pattern of spread through epidemic curves and other tools. As we will see, epidemic curves in turn can be used to determine uh, the mode of transmission when unknown. So, <clears throat> there are different types of modes of transmission. Horizontal, okay, transmission, this is the transmission of an agent from one person to the other of the same generation in the same population, okay? For example, uh, a group of fourth graders, something like that. But this differs from vertical transmission. This is the transmission of an agent from an individual to its offspring. Very commonly, we have situations where if mother is exposed to a particular pathogen, uh, it will have effects on the infant uh, in utero. And we'll talk about some of those diseases later on in the course. Direct contact transmission. This is transmission through physical contact between and uh, an infected person and a susceptible one. Okay, uh, might be handshake or a kiss on the cheek or something like that. But indirect contact transmission. This is transmission without direct contact. The contact occurs through contaminated surfaces or objects, as I've mentioned to you before, or through a vector. And now a vector is different from a, a fomite. A vector is living organisms that may be a reservoir for the pathogens or actively infect susceptible individuals with that pathogen. And so what we deal with here is a few examples. Remember, vertical transmission involves infectious disease spread from, for example, mother to child. Now, there are some similarities with the common terms transplacental, meaning transmission from mother to child through the placenta. Perinatal, meaning uh, the birth before, during, or slightly after birth. And postpartum, meaning after birth. All right. So this is transmission during any one of these situations. This would be referred to as vertical transmission. Now, if you see here, the first three of them are vertical in this diagram. One's transplacental, one's perinatal, and one's postpartum. What is interesting, you see, is HIV in all of them. But you will also see, for example, transplacental uh, pl rubella. Rubella known as German measles. As a matter of fact, that was a big problem in the 60s because the children uh, would come up and they might have rubella at the time. And uh, basically, if they come up with uh, in, in front of or have contact with a pregnant woman, the pregnant woman gets the rubella, but it is the developing infant that suffers the most. Uh, blindness, heart defects, and a variety of disorders that may eventually just lead to a miscarriage or a stillbirth. Now, with horizontal direct, we have several of them. Uh, sexual. Again, HIV, syphilis, by the way, included in that would also be hepatitis B and a variety of sexually transmitted diseases, two of which we will deal with later on in the course. Horizontal direct by droplets. The best uh, or most scary type is Ebola. As the person is um, basically having Ebola, the virus is destroying the uh, epithelial cells in the capillaries. And so the person is bleeding out of every orifice, eyes, okay, mouth, etc. And so as they might be shaking or something, it becomes aerosolized. And it can be picked up by any of the nursing staff. That's why with one of the outbreaks that occurred in Western Africa, they had to basically take 
and put people in extreme protective gear, personal protective gear, to keep them from picking up that disease. Now, in the horizontal indirect, let's take a look at this for a second, a vector that could be yellow fever or malaria, okay? For a formite, and by the way, the vector in that case was a mosquito. For formite, well, that could be uh, something where it's water, non-living, but it has the parasite in it, giardiitis, consuming the water. It gets in and causes all sorts of problems. It's a protozoa, and it leads to some very severe ailments in the gastrointestinal system. For horizontal indirect, we also have a vehicle. Okay, and that can be shigellosis, that can be E. coli, it could be a container, it can be um, something like, well, um, with some of them, it's, it's basically some food that has been consumed that is contaminated with that. Horizontal indirect also includes airborne. So, in this case, you don't have to know where even the source is. But anthrax, for example, which was considered also at, at, at a time uh, developed as a biological weapon, anthrax in its um, spore state can then be inhaled and then begin to develop in the lungs, it goes from the spore to the vegetative state and releases a variety of toxins. Hantavirus. The hantavirus is, is very well known. They had situations in Korea uh, where troops were in areas where there was an abundance of, your, of uh, mice or rats. But it's not the mice or rats that do this. It's the urine of that as it dries and becomes... Uh, available. We have the uh, four states that come together in uh, the Southwest, uh, such as Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, and I'm trying to think what the other one is, but it, 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 it evades me right now. But this is the main point. A lot of those animals that are in buildings that have been abandoned, and of course, they will urinate onto the concrete. Someone's trying to sweep up all the material. They will pick up the hantavirus that way. The uh, dried urine will become aerosolized and will become now um, a situation where you're going to have an infectious disease. Now, we're going to talk about for a minute the chain of infection. This is the spread between individuals or between individuals and the environment. Now, the sequencing, the sequencing of the chain provides a path or route taken using the chosen mode and includes the site of the pathogen presentation, otherwise known as the portal or the portal of end exit. Now, Presentation could be referred to as the portal of entry. You have a specific pathway used and a destination where the pathogen enters a new host. So here we have this. Now these routes from one mode to another may be singular or several and tell us how the pathogen will leave the body and infect another. The information can suggest whether a particular pathogen is more limited or widespread in its transmission, which in turn suggests how narrowly or broadly we define the disease control activities. Okay, let's start off with portal of entry. Portal of entry could be uh, something you consume, so by mouth. It could be actually by the eyes as well. Um, it can be a cut or by an assistance like a uh, tick or a, a mosquito to pierce the skin. Now, this brings up one other point though, you have to have a susceptible host. 
For example, a susceptible host is someone who has never had the uh, infection before or uh, has been vaccinated. So they will not be able to have the um, agent proliferate in their system. And so you have the infectious agent in the susceptible host. It may pass on to a reservoir. And what I mean by that is um, it can pass into various other animals. It can pass into waterways if someone is releasing it by the portal of exit. So the mode of transmission here to get entry is the key point here for how one will become infectious. But then afterwards, the reservoir may be a site where even though you have the portal of exit, the reservoir is going to resupply uh, more of the pathogens for others. What do I mean by that? Well, the reservoir can be something alive. Um, an example of that might be a mosquito or armadillo, and we'll get into a few of those in a minute. Or it could be just the fact that the reservoir is contaminated water. In the portal of exit, there is the concept of the oral fecal route. Someone, let's say, in the water supply, uh, basically releases a stool that may contain either the bacteria, the viruses, or um, cysts of various parasites. These will travel down and someone else is using the same river water to clean themselves and may get some of that inside of them, that water that has the contaminated pathogens. Now, Let's give, expand a little bit more this concept of reservoir. In the infectious disease ecology and epidemiology, a natural reservoir, also known as a disease reservoir or a reservoir of infection, is the population of organisms or the specific environment in which an infect, infectious pathogen naturally lives and reproduces. Now, you notice it said in there, uh, basically, or the specific environment. So the specific environment might be, for example, drinking water. It might be uh, an area where there are a lot of crops, etc. And yet people don't clean them. Okay. But we move up to this point where we talk about infectious pathogens where they naturally live and reproduce. So you have got mosquitoes, ticks. Uh, you may have situations where you have wild animals that can bite or their uh, droppings or urine will uh, basically contain some of the pathogens. Now, the pathogen needs the reservoir primarily for its survival. Reservoirs may include, uh, by the way, also other humans, as well as animals or non-living places in the environment. Okay, so some viruses have no non-human reservoirs. Poliomyelitis is one, and smallpox are prominent examples. Smallpox has been eradicated because of the development of vaccines and a worldwide strategy of vaccinating the population to basically reduce any possibility of susceptible individuals. And it has been basically uh, eradicated by about 1980. And there's only two places in the world where smallpox um, samples are being stored. Center for Disease Control. And in Russia, Vector. Okay. There's been an, an attempt at poliomyelitis to try to eradicate that. The problem that occurs is that when you get into uh, the Middle East 
and into certain areas of Asia, it is hard to get to vaccinate all of the individuals. Also, there's been a few cases where the attenuated virus becomes the wild strain, and the wild strain would be the active disease-causing strain. And so you have to flip over from a type of vaccine that's made attenuated to just a killed virus. Also, you have to keep in mind several other factors. You have a lot of fungal agents that live and multiply in the soil. Okay, those that cause cocidiomycosis, otherwise known as valley fever. Um, this causes infection when the aerosolized dust, which contains some of the particles of the fungus, are inhaled. And so they basically get into the individual and can cause certain symptoms, etc. Now, I thought I'd give you a couple of examples of reservoirs. A little bit of this was in the book, but I thought I'd expand it a little bit. So in soil, you have Colostridium botulinum, Colostridium tetani. Now, usually Colostridium bacteria species are those that can form uh, endospores and then don't become active again until basically they get into some sort of moist tissue, etc., such as humans. So nine times out of 10, it's inhaled. Cocidiomycosis, similar, but it's fungal. So it's going to have um, these small fragments of the hyphae that are going to guarantee that if they're inhaled, the infection occurs. So soil can be somewhat of a reservoir. Bats, these are the ones that believe to be the reservoir for Ebola. Wild rodents, these are the reservoirs for plague, tularemia, hantavirus, and leptospiridiosis. Um, you also have situations where you have related relatives. Um, the giant Gambian rat can carry monkeypox. Um, you also have prairie dogs that can sometimes carry either monkeypox or some other type of thing. In Central Asia, there are a lot of marmots, which are a type of small mammal, and they are believed to be sort of the reservoir for plague bacteria. Now, with reptiles and amphibians, you know, the types that, you know, they sell at pet stores, you know, small turtles and frogs and maybe a snake or such, a lot of times on their skin, they're going to have salmonella bacteria. Then we go to armadillos. Armadillos, particularly the seven or nine banded type, will be the reservoir for leprosy, otherwise known as Hansen's disease, for rabies, for parasitic worms. And then we have to deal with cats. Now, before someone starts yelling at me and telling me, oh, I'm, I don't like cats, I do like cats, but we have to be realistic about some of the things that happen. Cats can be reservoirs for ringworm, which is a fungal disease. Toxoplasmosis, which is a protozoal disease. Babesia microti, which is a, a protozoal disease. And leishmania. Okay. Particularly toxoplasmosis has come into uh, a lot of attention because of the fact that toxoplasmosis, once it gets into the brain, can produce a much greater amount of dopamine because it secretes um, basically tyrosine hydroxylase, tyrosine being the precursor to make L-dopa and then eventually making dopa. And this is why we may have situations where individuals are saying, well, there's that crazy cat lady. It may not be that she is crazy. She's infected with something that is disturbing the brain chemistry. Well, there's a lot more and this, of course, scratches just the surface. We're going to get into more later on. Now, the natural history of disease 
This refers to disease progression over time in an individual, assuming the person is not being treated. Now, that's the key point. For example, if you had um, basically, and I'm trying to think, I think it's um, plague. Plague, if it goes into the lungs and you are not treated, it is a hundred percent guaranteed death. If you come forward and you have plague with you in your lungs, otherwise known as pneumonic plague, basically, if you can get the necessary antibiotics and the treatment, you have a better chance of survival. Now, by the way, when I talk about natural history of diseases, it means that no external intervention is applied that might change the pathway from health to disease. So, as I said to you a few minutes ago, no preventive measures, no treatment. And in some cases, this is also uh, no sanitation, no controlled hygiene, etc. Okay? Understanding this progression will really allow you, allow us, to consider what factors could potentially alter this course of disease. It also provides a reference which allows us to understand how much interventions do or do not matter. Now, if you take a look here, you have this nice chart. It's in Orin. It's a very good descriptive uh, chart to tell you the progression of disease. The horizontal arrow indicates the time uh, in an individual's life and their progression through the disease stages. If you notice, the double red lines show possible points of prevention, primary, secondary, tertiary. You have a susceptible individual, and this is the area of um, the start of the exposure. Prevention here, well, you might have to be uh, vaccinated, give um, prophylactic antibiotics, or something just as simple as wearing a mask. Um, that might help. So you're exposed. Now here is the second level here. This would be the area where you are provided with um, whatever it is, antibiotics, antifungals, etc. But instead, what you have is the infection onset and the subclinical disease. Subclinical means basically that it hasn't gotten so profound yet. And usually it's after this that you start seeing the symptoms show up. Now you have, by definition, a clinical disease when you have the diagnosis. And the symptoms are going to be the signs that you see, whether it's fever, or nausea, or vomiting, um, certain discolorations of the sclera, the eyes, or uh, bumps, rashes, et cetera, in the skin, et cetera. Now, this last intervention here, tertiary, this might be something profound like massive antibiotics, antivirals, isolation. It may also need to be, uh, if it's, for example, parasitic, they might have to remove some of the parasites as well as give antiparasitic medication. So here you have the carrier or recovery or death. Carrier would be, of course, someone that continues to spread the disease. The individual who is sick may finally recover, or sadly, the individual dies as a result of the disease. Now, just to get some terms clarified here, when I talk about incubation period, this is the time between the exposure to the infectious agent and the first signs or symptoms of a clinical illness show up. Latent period, 
This is the time from requiring the infection to the onset of infectiousness. When you have the infection, it doesn't mean that you might be discharging or spreading uh, the pathogen. The onset of infectiousness, that's when you have things like, okay, came out by a sneeze, a cough, all right? Um, it came out uh, via stool or urine, um, even eye secretions may have something, okay? So, as we look at this progression through the spectrum of disease, we're going to get um, clarified on, on several different terms. Infectivity, which is defined as the number infected over the total exposed population times 100. Pathogenicity is the symptomatic cases over the number of infected cases. That was 100. Well, how does that differ? We'll get into that in a second. Virulence, that's the number of severe cases over the total cases times 100. So you have the infection onset right here. You have a latency period. You have an incubation period. But as soon as you start becoming infectious to others, you shift over from latency to incubation. Somewhere in here, you have symptoms that become apparent, and that's when you see clinical disease. To help you to give you some uh, ideas here, infectivity. Now, number of infected. This could be a situation where this is a disease that only shows up and affects children, for example. Most of the rest of the population is exposed, but they can brush it off. Or you have someone who is immunocompromised. Immunocompromised individuals may be infected, but the total exposed population it has the immunity uh, to repel the disease. Now, pathogenicity, that's the number of symptomatic cases versus the number of infected cases. You can have individuals that are infected versus the amount of symptomatic cases. An example, HIV. When HIV infected individuals, it would be six months or later before they would show any symptoms. They are infected but they haven't shown any of the symptoms that demonstrate, let's say, a diminished immunity or a lowered white cell count, etc. Finally, virulence, severe cases versus total cases times 100. Nipah virus. Nipah virus is an example of a disease it was first isolated in, um, I believe it was Indonesia or, or no, it was, I think, in Thailand. And some of these um, small villages, uh, the pigs would get infected with Nipah virus. They would not die. But when it passed over to humans, they would have the cases. And so when you talk about virulence, in this case, about 41% had severe cases to the point of death. So you would say that this is a very virulent disease. Some diseases mutate, and as a result, their virulence will increase. Other cases, their virulence, because of mutations, will basically decline. And so you have total cases, but none that are severe enough to lead to things like death. Now, when I talk about the spectrum of disease, I have a few other terms, but I want to give you these, these important terms so that you can re review them. Infectivity is the likelihood of disease infects others commonly examined using the proportion of exposed individuals who become infected. 
pretty straightforward. But pathogenicity is the likelihood of developing clinical disease, commonly examined through the proportion of infected individuals who develop the disease. Now, finally, you have virulence. This is the likelihood of developing severe disease, commonly examined through the proportion of diseased individuals who develop more severe or fatal outcomes. So this gives you the uh, pr perspective in infectivity of that others might be infected, whereas you have others that are not. This pathogenicity tells you whether you're going to actually, if you've been exposed, have a, a the developing clinical signs, okay, uh, compared to the, everyone else that's been infected. And finally, to help you here to understand virulence is those who are infected, how severe it may become. And this is very serious because we, in the beginning, didn't understand certain diseases, and yet they would have a high mortality rate, death rate. Now, with analytic epidemiology, these are studies that measure the association between a particular exposure and a disease and aim to further examine known associations or hypothesized relationships. Now, this is far different from the miasma nonsense that occurred well over uh, 150 years ago. Disease was caused by bad air. On the contrary, it is looking at the particular exposure and will attempt to examine the known associations or hypothesized relationships. Okay, in other words, if I go here, will this occur? If I go there, will this occur? So we have what we call the ratio of the odds of exposure among the cases over the odds among non-exposed. It is the commonly calculated measure of effect for case control studies. So when we talk about certain situations where maybe somebody went to, oh, let's see, um, they went to a large stadium and some of them came back sick, whereas everyone else was there, how could they have gotten it? And so you look at any of the associations. Remember, that part of epidemiology is to look for patterns. So if individuals come home and you have the analytical epidemiology people, the epidemiologist sitting there saying, okay, what did you have when you were at the stadium? Well, I had a hot dog. And everybody keeps saying about the hot dog. That gives them an idea. Others would just say, look, I had chips and nachos, or I had a drink, or I had popcorn, or whatever. But all the sick people had the hot dogs. Maybe there's something with the hot dogs that allowed these, that allowed these individuals to get sick. And we will be going into food poisoning and foodborne diseases later on in the course. So we move from here to two of the other factors. And one of them is called the risk ratio. It is known as the incidence proportion ratio or relative risk. And this is the ratio between two risks observed in the exposed and unexposed groups. Mathematically, we would show it like this. Risk ratio, incidence among exposed, incidence among unexposed. Or new cases among the exposed over the exposed population. New cases among unexposed and the unexposed population. You have to note that 
the risk ratio, which I symbolize as RR, has no units. And this is because they cancel each other out in the numerator and denominator. Now, there is one other way to look at all of this. And that is what you see is risk difference. This is a difference, uh, refers to the difference in risk between two groups. <laughs> The risk difference refers to the difference in the risk between the two groups of basically incidents among the exposed minus incidents among the unexposed. Again, let's go back to the uh, to the baseball stadium. Okay, let's say you have New York City, and everybody's a Yankees fan, but. Not everybody got to go to that stadium. And yet, the people that were exposed were so many. And you compare that to the cases among the unexposed. You might get a small number. But it depends on how many consumed, let's say, the hot dogs that were bad or something to that effect. Now, when I look at all of this, we get to the odds ratio. And this is a ratio of the odds of an outcome given exposure compared to the odds of an, of an outcome of, for the unexposed. And again, this gets to be kind of, for some people, very difficult math, but it's really straightforward. It's basically saying, what are the odds if I went to that stadium that I didn't get sick versus what are the odds if I went to that stadium and got sick? Well, you have the exposed cases over the unexposed cases, the exposed controls versus the unexposed controls. And that's your odds ratio. Uh, but before I go, I'm going to just bring up a couple of very important points here. A lot of times today, the civilian population doesn't consider the numbers. As a matter of fact, numbers kind of become a blur to them. Part of the reason is, aside of paranoia to math is because they're afraid to actually get something, even if it is very rare. But it has been discussed for some time in epidemiology and in a variety of other sciences that we now have in this period of time the capability to literally fly around the world. And so, um, Basically, you could have someone who has, for example, Ebola fly from West Africa, land and walk around and cough a little bit here and there in the London International Airport, and that could spread the disease. Or you could have someone who is diagnosed but then kept in the plane. OK, and maybe everybody else as they are monitored for the possibility of signs. Let's get used to some of the real terminology. Endemic. This is a usual or constant prevalence of a disease in a population within a geographic area. Case in point, the common cold. An epidemic is an increase or higher than expected numbers in the prevalence of a disease in a population within a geographic area. So we had in the late 90s suddenly this spiking of West Nile, West Nile virus. It had never been there before, but it had spread quite rapidly not only merely in that geographic area, but throughout the United States. Because in part, if the mosquito with the virus bit a human being, 
They might be exposed, but not infected. As for birds, if they were bitten, nine times out of ten, they would die. And so there were suddenly broadcasts saying, if you see a dead bird, call uh, this number, do not attempt to pick it up, etc., because of you, you're going to be exposed to the West Nile virus. Now, how does an epidemic, how is it distinguished from an outbreak in its greater geographic or temporal reach? Well, when you go from an epidemic, and WHO, World Health Organization, has sort of these scales, and the scales or ratings is you start with a certain level of an epidemic. Once you start going over a couple of uh, boundaries of nations, then you start looking at the potential of a pandemic. So a pandemic is an epidemic that is spread. It's widespread or has global spread and impact. It may affect a large number of people. Case in point, also COVID. Once COVID left China and became sort of showing up in different countries, it became a pandemic. But what's a cluster? I hear a cluster here and there. And it's an aggregation of cases of a disease or another health related condition, such as cancer or birth defect closely grouped in time and place, okay? A cluster was one of the first things in June of 81 that doctors had uh, filed a report of an unusual grouping of gay men in San Francisco in 1981 that started to show up with sort of the opportunistic infections and then sadly in some cases died. And they put that as the starting date for when they started seeing AIDS uh, become very prevalent. Now an outbreak is a sudden increase in the disease frequently, frequency. And this is related to time, place, and observed population. An example of an outbreak would be something where a disease many times is communicable and many times suddenly you have a few people within a short, very short period of time, it is spread to a much larger grouping of people, a town or a state. Okay. So. Here we have a histogram. Now, a histogram, basically, as you can see, you have your y-axis and you have your x-axis. A histogram of the total number of West Nile virus neuroinvasive disease cases in the United States by the year since 2000. Okay. Disease was only introduced into the U.S. in 1999. And so in the early years, even though the case counts were low, this would be considered an, epi an epidemic phase. By 2004, however, the disease was well established across the United States, and that's where you get your black line here, through, uh, through the ep epidemic years. So in other words, here's 2000, barely uh, the cases. Now, what I'm talking about is I'm not talking about birds now. I'm talking about human beings. And then you see this shooting up in 02, 03, and then stabilizing over a series of time. And this is an averaging out of the black line. So we still have West Nile virus. And every once in a while, you will hear cases of it in the news. It either affects profoundly the elderly or the very, very young, you know, babies and infants. It's still there. Now, what causes some of these uh, changes? It may be because those are the years in which the vector for the virus is proliferating. It's favored. So, you know, wet and 
swampy lands and things like that. It may be because you had migratory birds that would come into the area, they would get infected, but before they fell to the ground and died, they would be uh, capable of spreading this to other mosquitoes. And so it spreads beyond that. So we move from here to a couple of other measures. And this is called the epidemic curve or the epi curve. And the epidemic curve is a modified histogram, which you just saw, that plots cases on the y-axis and time, and usually in, that's in days, on the x-axis. So cases are on the y-axis, on the x-axis is days. Because the curve uses a continuous data, that is, in time, there are no gaps between the entries unless no cases were reported for that period of time. So in other words, if you go back to this particular chart, you had no cases in 2009. It would just be a flop out, but it's not. Like any figure, the axis labels and the title should be informed of such that the figure can stand alone peaks and the growth of the epidemic are being are dictated by the incubation period and the infectiousness respectively. So uh, incubation period could be a short period of time within, let's say, a week or so. Infectiousness, well, you know, when they started to spray uh, for the mosquitoes, the vector, and eliminate those, or eliminate the breeding grounds of the mosquitoes, you can see some resistance in the spread of it. The curve shows the progression of the epidemic. The shape of the curve informs the probable type of exposure as well. Now, epidemic curve is based on sources of contamination as well as incubation time of the pathogen in the host. So you have situations where it depends on the host. It could be intermittent. It could be continuous. Let me give you an example. A continuous source outbreak like cholera from the Broad Street pump. This will continue to grow, then plateau until the source is removed. Now, I gave you in week two a very short but very informative, um, basically uh, a video about Jon Snow, who's considered the father of uh, epidemiology. I encourage you to review it because he didn't have everything in front of him, germ theory, etc. But he was able to plot where everybody's cases were and asking them, where did you get your water? That's where you make the contacts. And eventually it came to being just the broad street of water. And so what they did was he had them remove the pump handle. And it's hypothesized that somewhere down in the underground water supply, may have been contaminated by um, a septic or whatever, and that's what provided more of the individual suffering. And believe me, these individuals died very quickly within a matter of days upon contracting this particular strain of cholera. Now, the propagating source outbreak is one where cases lead to new cases and the epidemic builds, okay? You can have a conference such as we had in the beginning um, of the United States getting COVID. Uh, Biogen in Boston, you had 1,300 scientists talking about something else, but they were all exposed to COVID and then they basically went home to their different countries and states, et cetera bringing the disease. 
So a propagating source of the outbreak, it could be something like a new spreading of mosquitoes, or it could be something that it's man-made in the sense of a conference or a concert or whatever. Now, an intermittent source, like waterborne exposures from runoff from an agricultural field, can also be um, one situation. Uh, it's very common that sometimes you will have uh, waterborne diseases coming off from agricultural fields. And by the way, when I'm talking agricultural fields, I'm not necessarily necessarily talking about, oh, wow, it's going to be filled with uh, pesticides or fertilizer. Rather, it may be runoff from large amounts of pig fertilizer, pig uh, manure, or cow manure, etc. And this runoff may also contain some of the various bacteria and spores, etc. that if someone is exposed to them, they may get. Now, the gap between peaks is a combination of incubation periods and whatever is promoting the exposure itself. That's what you need to keep in mind. And you can see this. You have four types of epidemic curves here. You have a point source. It builds up and dies down. You have a continuous source. And so you see this building up as time goes on. You have an intermittent source. So you have this high amount and then some time without it. And then it comes back and then it basically stops. And then it comes back again. Now, a propagating source, you may have a little bit, have a time period, then you have a larger amount, but then another break in the time period. And then you have this much greater amount. So four types of epidemic curves. Basically, uh, when you're graphing an epidemic, keep in mind that the x-axis is time. Usually it's in days. And the y-axis is the number of cases. Each bar on this histogram then represents the number of cases on a given day of the epidemic. The shape of this curve, so this is what you see here, informs the probable source of an outbreak and can help identify incubation periods. Is it continuous? Is it intermittent? And basically, there is a nice area, a uh, nice tool to learn more about the epi curves. You can have a look at uh, a great site, great website um, by the Public Health Agency of Canada, and there is the URL to get it. Okay, now we're going to get into just a brief amount about quantifying disease transmission. You need to get used to these terminologies. Contact tracing. This is also known as contact investigations. They provide a systematic process to identify people known as contacts who have been exposed to cases of an infectious disease. When you talk about patient zero, that's the first person that has had the ailment. And it may be discovered by contact tracing. And it may be because of this person bringing the disease from another place or being exposed to something unique, but then spreading it to others. Now, descriptive epidemiology, this is epidemiology that describes the person, place, time, and often will summarize data in tables and graphs. When we talk about the basic reproductive number, this is called the R0 or R0. It's the number of secondary infections that will arise from a single case in a fully susceptible population. That's the key point, fully susceptible. This is where you find out how communicable this particular disease is. Effective reproduction number, sometimes uh, called the RE or RT. This is the number of secondary infections. And this estimate changes over the course of an epidemic 
as the number of susceptible individuals and therefore the contact between infectious and susceptible individuals change. So what are we saying here? Okay. First off, let's talk about RO for a second, or R0. And when we calculate the number of secondary infections in a totally naive population, we are estimating how many secondary infections will arise as the result of that single case. I remember when I was talking with a colleague and COVID was just starting to really break into the um, mindset of Americans. They hadn't done the full shutdown yet, et cetera. And she said, well, I think it's really more like uh, 1.01. And I'm like, <clears throat> I don't think it's that. That, not that low. When we talk about the basic reproductive number, it's written as an RO. And a lot of times you'll see is the R and then the O will be somewhat uh, below. Sort of, uh, anyways, uh, sunken down. RO captures three components of disease transmission. One, the frequency of contact between susceptible and infected individuals. Two, the probability that the interaction will lead to a transmission. And three, how long an infected individual is infectious and able to infect susceptible individuals. For example, Measles, the RO is estimated to be between 12 and 18. And this is depending on the population density and the behavior. Seasonal flu is between 0 0.9 and 2.1, depending on the year, the population density and behavior. And when I say that, really what I'm also saying is, depending on the strain of the flu, okay? When RO is close to one, each infected person will infect one additional individual and the disease will neither grow nor die out. It'll just remain stable. But if it's greater than one, then one case will lead to at least one more case and the disease will establish in a population may cause an outbreak. So think about this, go back to measles. Measles as an RO of 12 to 18. So it's conceivable you're going to, if you had measles, come in contact with a variety of people if they're susceptible and infect 12 to 18 of them. That's incredible to think about. If you have this greater than one, the disease will establish itself in the population and may cause an outbreak. If it's less than one, then each case leads to less than one additional case, and it's likely that the disease will die out, not become established in this new population of exposed individuals. How quickly the disease grows or dies out is a function of how many additional cases result from the exposure. Now, mind you, I want to just clarify one other thing. This is if you are susceptible. If you're vaccinated, you're not susceptible. If you've already had the disease and you have built up immunity against the disease, you are not susceptible. So if we look at the reproductive number, measure of the transmissibility of, uh, transmissibility, excuse me, of an infectious disease, as you can see in this chart, uh, this figure we usually represent two different RO values as a hypothetical disease progresses through three generations, okay? Now, what you have to keep in mind is this. These are all susceptible in this kind of orange. In this almost light orange, you have tertiary cases. In the purple, that's your index case. In the gray, that's your quaternary cases. But look at the difference. In the RO of two, it's going to take time. You've got one and then two, and then you start spreading slower. If you have an RO of six, 
you have one and you have begun to really infect quite a few. And this continues to cascade because the RO of six for this individual is the same as this person who has an RO of six and this person here. And so it, the greater the RO, the greater the chance that this is going to spread and spread very, very quickly. That's what I want you to walk away from in your mind. Let's say we had a comparison of reproductive numbers of RO of four infectious diseases. Now we're going to take measles with an estimated RO of 17, smallpox with an estimated RO of six, COVID RO of about three, and influenza an RO of about 2.5, okay? Now you gotta keep in mind that RO is not a measure of the disease severity. You get it or you don't. It's sort of like a digital world. It's not how bad is it? It's you got it, okay? It's helpful in comparing across diseases by providing guidance when estimating the needed response and how quickly the cases will enter the healthcare system. So if we have here time, and the number of infected uh, individuals, you can see that very quickly with an RO of 17, you're gonna have this massive spike and it's gonna take quite some time. Now I'm presuming that when they say time here, they're talking days, okay? If you take a look with smallpox, smallpox would take off for a while and begin to subside, in part because you will have uh, individuals enter the healthcare system for uh, basically treatment, etc. You look at COVID, it sometimes takes off, but then takes, oh, about almost 30 days before you really see starting to shift down. Finally, influenza. That peaks at about 40 days almost, and then takes a much, much longer time to drop down and, and uh, basically burn itself out. Now, a couple things just as a sidebar. Smallpox, because we've eradicated it, any case that shows up in, in, in the world. Um, one, smallpox was set up to be also a biological warfare agent, so that would be something. But the other thing is that there might be a few places hidden where something might be like smallpox. Um, and the unfortunate thing is you would get a much more aggressive medical attack on this because it had been previously uh, eradicated. Two, measles. You might say to yourself, well, why do we have measles? We have our MMR vaccines. Yes, you do. But you, we're going to get into this terminology later on, herd immunity. And that is the number of individuals that are necessary to be protected so that any outbreak basically burns itself out very quickly. Unfortunately, some local communities, not only in the United States, but in the UK and other places, individuals have not been necessarily getting their children vaccinated, or they have not sustained their vaccination into adulthood. And as a result, they suddenly become susceptible. And when you go below the levels of herd immunity, some of these very, very aggressive diseases, and I say aggressive in the sense of they have a high RO, are going to pop up and they're going to spread. Okay. Now, just have to finish off with some other concepts of descriptive epidemiology. Now, this is deep epidemiology that describes the person, place, and time, and often will summarize data in tables and graphs. We're going to go from the RO to the SIR model. 
in the SIR model talks about susceptible, infectious, and recovery. The three components of RO are actually the two, com two of the components of uh, basically uh, beta. And beta, as you can see here, tells you certain aspects, all right? It's the frequency of contact, contacting infected individuals. The probability that interaction will lead to transmission and the duration of infectiousness, which is one over gamma. Here's gamma, here's beta. So these are the two components that make up the RO. Now you can flip the RO, have the gamma here, and make that determination of the beta. Now, the recovery rate is also known as um, the gamma, why it didn't show up so well, or one over the duration of the infection. This can be estimated from the clinical data as it is the period when a person is shedding enough pathogen to potentially infect others, okay? Beta, and gamma parameters are usually iteratively estimated from both the literature and from the modeling process. So what I mean by that is basically there are estimations or determinations from um, perhaps public health data or research papers, etc. And we move over to the SIR model. And this is a simplified model. There's two types of them I want you to be aware of, a closed model and an open model. When we have an SIR compartment model, this is where the susceptible individuals, S, become infected, so that's I, move to an infectious state, then recovered, which is R. In the process, if you'll notice that beta again and that gamma again, this version of the model is an open system when there are births and deaths in the system. Births add uh, or bring new susceptible individuals into here. If you have a closed model, it's going to exclude births, so this completely is removed. And hence, you have a limited number of susceptible individuals here. Now, mind you, each one of these is going to have some death, and that's in the mu symbol here, okay? When you take a look at a simple SIR compartmental uh, model, this is where susceptible individuals, S, become infected, move to the infectious I, then to the recovered R, which I said. Now, this version of the model that you see uh, in the subsequent will be open. This one you see right now is closed. Open is when there are births and deaths in the system. Births add or bring new susceptible individuals into the uh, formulation. A closed model excludes births, hence limits the number of susceptible individuals. Now you're going to have three examples here of hypothetical outbreak of a disease with an RO of eight. All right? The susceptible individuals are red. So you see this, and you see how they, the numbers drop down. The infected off their green. The recovered are going to be kind of, uh, excuse me, the, the coloring here, the infectious are going to be, this is the green, and the recovered are going to be sort of in this bluish color. So what happens is very quickly when this short period of time, you're going to see this massive rise of recovered. Okay? Now, no matter whether you have an open or closed system, uh, 
you're going to end up having some unusual data. And this is completely aside. Um, your curves will be completely different. If you have A, an open population, and B, a uh, medical intervention, okay? And we'll show you this. The um, final one is the same disease with an open system, but where 87% of the population is vaccinated. So here you have this, okay? So you have an open population, and you're going to start off with a certain amount that are susceptible. They will dive down, and then there's going to be this little wiggle and continuing onward. The infected will take off but then dive down. And what you have also about this time is you have this increase. Mind you, the R O is still 8, and you're going to have this being the group that's recovered. But what happens if I had an open population? Remember now, this is basically the fraction of the population affected, and this is uh, the x-axis is time. What if I had 87% vaccination? Here's my susceptible population, much, much lower now. Here is the ones that get infected. And here's, here are the ones that are recovered. Or one could sit there and say they got infected because they were vaccinated and then they were able to fight it off with antibodies, etc. So what am I trying to say here? In an SIR model, several things occur. One is it tells you basically the susceptible, the infected, the recovery, but also it gives you a difference between those that are closed population groups, no births or deaths, those that are open systems where births bring new susceptible individuals into the uh, numbers. That's one. Two is if the population gets vaccinated, the numbers of these cases is much, much lower. Okay? So that's it for this week. You are to review the lecture, the lecture PowerPoints. I want you first and foremost to view the video clip on Jon Snow's work to control cholera in London. Then read all the supplemental articles in Module 2. View all videos in Module 2. Participate and complete the discussion for Week 2. Now, some discussion assignments require you to review this week's videos or supplementary, supplementary materials to help you. And as always, you need to cite your uh, sources of information. Finally, complete the quiz for week two. And as always, what I usually do is you have two shots at this. Take the first one, uh, uh, the quiz first, look it over and see what you got wrong. Go back and take it again. The computer will issue you the grade that is the highest of the two. Okay. And we will see each other later. Have a good day.